The markets are calm before the storm. This is Friday, about three o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and the markets are getting ready to close. Bitcoin is bumping up and down, as well as other crypto, Ethereum, all crypto assets are kind of ranging right now. So let's take a look at what's going on. The markets were down a little bit this morning on the jobs report. So what do I mean by calm before the storm? So markets have been relatively flat after a nice little rebound here the last few weeks. But we have this interesting payroll report today where 528,000 jobs were gained in July. Basically, most of the jobs, if not all of the jobs lost in the pandemic in terms of numbers, have been now replaced or reclaimed. Um, the question is, you know, what types of jobs are these? And they're mostly in the service sector, a lot of government uh, jobs that were created. So the interesting thing about this is this kind of clouds the water for the Fed because the economy is appearing to be strong, adding jobs. Inflation is still strong. We're going to get the report next week on inflation. That's another storm that I'm talking about. So you have the perfect storm. You have strong jobs. You have what appears to be a strong economy, although we had a negative GDP print in the face of all this. So the Fed has a dilemma. They have got to get inflation under control. If that inflation prints in the nines again or higher, some people are calling for higher, some are calling for lower. Uh, but if it prints hotter, the Fed has got to come out and come out strong to get inflation under control because as people go back to work, that's more money that's going to get pumped into the economy. And they, the Fed can't do anything about supply. All they can do is demand destruction. And how do they do that? By making people feel less wealthy, by ruining asset prices. The housing market is uh, still pretty hot in a lot of markets. It's correcting in others. But it, with interest rates and bond yields where they are, bonds rose a little bit on this news today, 2.8%. Um, you know, that's keeping pressure. Low bond rates are keeping pressure on mortgage rates to come, you know, to stay down, which is obviously spurring a little bit of demand in the housing, but not much. Um, still record low mortgage rates. Um, the mortgage industry is preparing for a major restructuring as companies are going out of business. People are getting laid off because demand is just down um, across the board. But it's an interesting setup for the Fed and what they have to do because they have got to get after inflation. You can see right here uh, where the jobs were created all in one chart. Leisure and hospitality led the pack. Well, yeah, professional jobs right behind it. Healthcare, government was a big one. Uh, transportation, retail, manufacturing, construction. So the you know, where the supply is um, created is where the least amount of jobs were created. Where the demand is is where the most jobs were created. So very interesting dilemma for the Fed. So let's take a look at the charts. Bitcoin, uh, as we've been looking at, it's been in this bear flag range. Um, waiting for further guidance in terms of uh, you know what the Fed's going to do and what recession is going to look like. So right now, it just, it just appears to be another bear flag until the trend breaks. This trend line here that we've been kind of watching uh, until that trend line ultimately breaks uh, to the downside. Um, you know, that's all we can do is just kind of wait and watch and see price kind of trend along here. The interesting thing is, I tried to do this the other day, and it's as you know, I'm no techno technical analyst. I'm a macro investor. I invest in real estate companies, stocks, crypto, uh, serial entrepreneur since 1997. If you knew the channel, I talk about all kinds of things. I talk about real estate investing and development, entrepreneurship, uh, buying companies, building companies, investing in stocks, crypto, but mainly from a global macro perspective. That's how I make all my uh, investment decisions, business decisions, and that's how I've made them since my full-time for work, foray into entrepreneurship in 1997. I've been self-employed since then, have not looked back. So that's kind of my journey. Um, so I use these charts just to kind of track ranges, patterns, things like that. As we know, Bitcoin and crypto have been in a you know macro bull cycle since existence. It's just been number you know, straight up. It, it provides the biggest and best returns. You hear a lot of the numbers quoted about how Bitcoin and crypto have uh, outpaced everything else in terms of returns, that's because they started from zero. So if you started every stock from zero or every piece of real estate from zero, well, your returns would be thousands of percents as well. The problem is when a stock gets listed, it gets listed at a price versus starting from zero. Um, you know, so the returns are exponential a lot of times. We've looked at a couple of meme stocks lately that have had a thousand percent return, but obviously when you have a 
asset like Bitcoin that started from zero and hit 64,000. I mean, there's nothing else really has done that other than real estate. There's been real estate that started at zero and uh, has had exponential gains like that, but not in 10 years necessarily. And uh, the problem with, a, with you know, an asset like this and the whole narrative of HODL and, you know, buy and hold and you'll never lose money. And, you know, anybody who's bought Bitcoin or crypto and, well, at least Bitcoin in four years has never lost money. Well, it just depends on where you buy. You know, if you bought right up here at the peak of uh, 2021, here we are a year and a half later. And, you know, is it going to get back to there in two and a half years? I don't know. So it really, a lot of it depends on where you buy. And, you know, ideally, if you're a long-term holder, you want to buy the dips and sell the rips and kind of grow your portfolio. If you are a believer in Bitcoin, your goal should be to accumulate more. How do you accumulate more if your uh, resources are limited? Because you don't want to borrow to buy Bitcoin. I know there's a narrative out there, Michael Saylor telling everybody, sell your house, you know, get a lien on your house or borrow against your house, sell everything you own, borrow against your company and buy Bitcoin. You know, that's great to tell people to do, to come into the space, but he's not personally following his own advice. You can go back and look at all of his interviews and his loans are unsecured. They're business loans. Uh, he didn't leverage his house. He's not taking everything he owns personally and selling it and buying Bitcoin. So he's telling people to do what he's not doing. So you got to watch these narratives that people tell you to do. Um, so if you're not borrowing, you're not leveraging, and you're just buying using cash and your cash flow is limited, then what you do is you buy on the dips, you sell on the rips, buy lower, sell higher, buy lower, sell higher, buy lower, sell higher, so you can accumulate more. And you know that should be the ultimate goal is to accumulate more. So if you're just dollar cost averaging down, you're just reducing your buying power ultimately. If you just sold here and waited till you got down here, then you could buy exponentially more than you would have if you dollar cost average down. So that's one way to look at it. Uh, everybody's got to do what's right for them and their system and their business model. Some people allocate every week, every month, no matter what. Uh, some people dollar cost average down, but I've always been a range player, whether it's business, real estate, stocks, doesn't matter what it is. I like to buy on the dips, sell on the rips and run with the ranges in the cycle. So that's why I watch the trends. That's what I use the charts for. And then there's, you know, obviously uh, macroeconomic cycles that you have to watch as well. The business cycle, right? The peaks and the valleys, the dips, the ranges and the trends. But right now, this is the 200 uh, day moving average. Bitcoin rejected off that. It's been under it ever since. The question is, will it come back up and touch it again somewhere out in this area? Uh, will Bitcoin range for a little while, come up, pop that 200 day moving average again before it ultimately rolls over into a longer, more bear market consolidation like we've seen in the past and where have we seen examples so the red line is the 200 day moving average uh, in 2018 when price uh, collapsed it came up rejected it the 200 day moving average rolled over and you can see these bear flag consolidations as price worked its way down and ultimately came back up rejected under the 200 day moving average again didn't get quite close but rejected again then consolidated a little more before a final drop uh, so if you look at that price action, it was a year that it, all of this took um, for it to play out. It was basically exactly one year to get to the bottom. And it came up to that 200 day moving average a couple of times along the way. And this has been a little bit more of a drawn out process. But again, same kind of price action where it consolidates, drops, consolidates, maybe pops up a little bit, drops, pops up, drops. And you can see another thing that's happening here as well is these ranges that it gets back to sometimes uh, before it goes on for that next move. So if you look at these lower ranges here, now this was back during the Doquan timeframe here where you know price was a little bit skewed. And of course, Michael Saylor was buying, but you have this low range here, price would be rejecting off that line. Coming across there, you have this low range here where price never really got back to it right there, not, not a great straight line, but you get the idea, price never got back to it. Same thing here, if I can kind of run along this dotted line here, I'm using a mouse uh, or you know, on, on a touchpad, uh, Mac is what I use. Um, used to be a PC guy, but I'm a Mac guy now, maybe I'll make a video on that one day, but uh, used you know Windows PCs forever, switched to Mac a few years ago and have not looked back, never will. But anyways, you kind of have this where the price dropped to initially kind of you just kind of draw a line over there. Price kind of ma maintains itself in that area. 
again, this range was a little manipulated with Michael Saylor still buying. The Quan buying kind of drove price a little crazy. But the last time you had this line straight across, price did not quite make it up, did not quite make it up. So that's kind of been the resistance zone and it hasn't really you know, made it up in this area. It's getting somewhat close. So that's kind of something to watch there. If price does get above that and break up, then you could potentially have a reversal uh, coming along. So let's remove all these drawings. So that's what you'd be looking at there. And then of course, on the weekly, uh, we've been tracking this 200 week moving average and price is now getting back below. It came up a little bit above it and has been now rejecting off of it. So we need to see if price can reclaim that 200 week moving average. And it, you know, that's possible that the price could find, you know, a base right here in this range, like we've been talking about between that 17, eight and, uh, you know, 24,000 range and just kind of range in here for a while, while the macro environment plays itself out, recession, things like that. So that's entirely possible and not off the table yet. And unfortunately, there's no way to know. Nobody knows for sure what's going to happen. It's all about liquidity. It's all about the Fed. How aggressive do they get? What does QT look like when they start rolling off the balance sheet? What do traditional markets do? Because really everything hinges uh, from a price action standpoint on traditional markets. And as we see, the Dow is in a nice bear market rally, has been. Now it's in this little consolidation before potentially the next drop, especially with the Fed coming out, commenting on jobs with the hawkish talk that they've had. But we've seen this movie before, if you will, if you go back and look towards any other bear market cycles that we've had in traditional markets. Um, this, was the la this was the taper tantrum here. Last couple of times the Fed tried to stop uh, QE and stop, uh, you know, raising it, start raising interest rates and stop QE, uh, markets roll over. And then of course, 2009 was the last real traditional bear market that we had. And you can see how markets just kind of roll over into that, uh, cycle right back in here. And this took a little while for this to happen, you know, and how, how the markets kind of work their way down and work themselves down. So, Really, at the end of the day, it's liquidity. This was $2 trillion that pumped these markets straight up from the bottom in March of 2020, all of them just basically straight up. So that liquidity is coming out of the market. It has to unwind. And here's Bitcoin on that same path. And then, you know, the unwinding started and there was another run, irregular correction. This was the retracement alt season, things like that. And then it's just been bear flag, bear flag, bear flag, working its way down to try to find the bottom. A lot of technical confluence that it potentially could get back to this 14,000, 12 to 14,000 level, and maybe it gets back there and puts in a base. Uh, maybe it goes back down and checks the uh, ma you know, macro cycle bottom around here in this $3,000 level uh, after 2018 where it hit. So we just don't know. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people will tell you the price is absolutely definitely going to get back to 100,000 and beyond. We don't know that. Uh, one scenario could be this could be somewhat of a top that Bitcoin is putting in locally right now for a little while. I doubt that, especially with the announcement from BlackRock the other day um, that we talked about where BlackRock is partnering with Coinbase um, as a fulfillment partner to help bring institutional clients into the space. And again, like we talked about, that's not something that's gonna to happen tomorrow or next week, or even by the end of the year, potentially. Um, they're gonna to wanna to see more regulation. They're gonna to wanna to see more stability in price. And they're gonna allocate bits at a time, little bits at a time. But the main thing that those investors are watching out for is they're gonna to wanna to see this price stabilize. They're gonna to wanna to know that Bitcoin is stabilized, has found a bottom. The global macro environment is, is, there's more certainty there, especially from the Fed in terms of what's going on before um, they start allocating to the space, but they will allocate to the space. So there's potentially hundreds of billions to a trillion or more of investable capital in the institutional world, just on small one, 2% of, of assets that could potentially enter the space going into next year. So uh, that is encouraging. And that tells you that Bitcoin's not going anywhere. It's not going away. Ethereum's not going anywhere. It's going through the uh, you know, the merge, moving from proof of work to proof of stake. There's differing opinions, expert opinions uh, on whether or not that's going to work, what the miners are going to do, all those types of things. We, again, we don't know until it happens. We'll have to wait and see what that's going to do ultimately to the price and to the, and to the asset itself. Uh, and then the other altcoins out there, which ones are going to survive, which ones aren't. Time will tell. 
and we'll just have to wait and see. But uh, as far as Bitcoin goes, it's not going anywhere. The question is, what value will it ultimately settle at for a base, for a uh, new uh, macro bottom for this cycle? And where will it go next for an all-time high? Nobody knows for sure. Uh, nobody knows that it will go up, that it will go down, or how far it goes either way. What we do know is where it's been, what the patterns have looked like in the past. But as the asset matures, more capital comes into the space, we get regulation, that will change. Especially if you get a spot ETF, you get uh, institutional capital coming into the space, all those types of things. That will drive the price uh, back up again. But the question is how far? That we don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, but it's easy to... Uh, anticipate, and it's probable that it could reach 100,000, somewhere in that range, because it reached the 60s. So 100 is not too far from that. That's also realistic and probable. It could reach back to 3,500 because it was there recently in 2020. Uh, so those are the ranges we're looking at. These are the things I'm looking at. I'll see you in the next video.